Hello, welcome back to Garden Obsessed. My name is Carla, and today seemed like an awesome opportunity to elaborate on a topic that I think is often not given the attention that it deserves. Um, you may have seen that the USDA released an updated plant hardiness zone map for the US this week, which is exciting. Um, it's got updated information, which we'll go into. But a lot of times, I think, in areas outside of the U.S., we use this information to describe our own zones, and that may not, well, it not may not be accurate. It isn't accurate. It's comparing apples to oranges. And I never see anyone talk about this, um, especially I get frustrated when I see Canadian content creators using... American terminology that doesn't apply to us and I think a lot of people might not be aware that it doesn't apply to us and why. So first we'll talk about the new map and stuff. So um, in about the 1920s and 1930s there were a few researchers out of Boston that started trying to kind of define growing zones or at least what you know um, what areas or delineate and be able to measure what areas different plants could grow in. Eventually that turned into the plant hardiness map um, that the USDA, which is the Department of Agriculture, created in, I believe the first one was around 1960. Originally they also included Canada and Mexico in those maps that they used to put out. Um, it was originally for a shorter period of time, I believe it was like 10 or 15 years that they included in developing those maps. And when they came out with the new version in 1990, they no longer included Canada and Mexico. In Canada, um, the um, what's now Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada developed their own map. In Canada, Unlike the U.S., which uses an extreme um, average low temperature to delineate its zones, each zone is separated by 10 degrees Fahrenheit. That is the sole factor or variable that is used to create those maps. In Canada, our um, agriculture agency decided to use a more comprehensive system. So there are actually seven factors. One of the most common questions I think that people ask and get a common answer to is, do plant zones matter? And a lot of times in the US, the answer they're given is no. If you're growing annual vegetables or annual um, plants of any kind, it doesn't matter because it has nothing to do with your growing season length or anything like that. Um, and to a certain extent, that's true. But when you're asking that question in Canada and you're talking about um, plant hardiness zone map, the answer is more complicated. And I think the answer is it depends. So it does depend, like, you know, are you growing annuals or are you growing perennials? Of course, it matters how cold your temperatures are getting over the winter if you're growing perennials. Things that I include in my vegetable garden, like um, rhubarb and asparagus, berry bushes, um, apple trees, things like that. Certainly the answer for those is yes, but also, in the Canadian system, it recognizes there are other factors other than just the lowest temperature that are also important. So I'll run through, they call this equation the index of suitability. And included in that calculation is the mean, which is just a scientific statistic term for average, the mean daily minimum of the coldest month, which is probably going to be January or February, the mean frost-free period above zero degrees, so that's your, that's your um, growing season. In the U.S., it's also you know, said often that your plant hardiness zone has nothing to do with the length of your growing season. Well, here in Canada, it does. It's one of the seven factors. Um, 
the rainfall from June to November, which is typically considered the main growing season, the mean daily maximum of the warmest month. So that's probably going to be July or August in most provinces. Um, a winter factor, which is its own calculation, but it includes the January precipitation. Snowfall can be an important um, factor in how well your perennials will overwinter. A heavy two or three layer of snow is very insulating and you could have the same temperatures, but with no snowfall, you're going to have a lot harder time surviving those cold temperatures. So that's what that factor is all about. Um, and then the final one is the maximum 30 year wind gusts. So wind is also an important factor of winter survivability. Um, wind can be very drying and very harsh on plants. So Already, I think you can see that this is a much more in-depth, and that's why our hardiness zone in Canada map doesn't line up with the U.S. map. I always say I'm a zone 5 Canada because it is nothing like zone 5 in the U.S. And the rule of thumb is typically that if I'm a zone five in Canada, it's going to be a lower zone in the U.S. because all of these things are not factored in. It's only considering our winter lows uh, temperature wise. So borderline, I'm prob I would probably be considered a U.S. zone four just going by temperature. Um, a really good example of this is... Um, you know, how you can't just go by temperature alone is Central Florida is actually a zone 10 USDA. If you use the temperature guidelines set out by the USDA in their in their map, um, Ireland, parts of Ireland are also considered a zone 10, but you won't see palm trees growing in Ireland, for example. They are affected by, um, you know, the Gulf Stream keeps them much more temperate. So what that means is their winters don't get as cold, their summers don't get as hot, um, especially for a country that's as north um, as they are compared to Florida. So, you know, it, it's the coldest temperature over the winter is not the determining factor in a lot of situations, right? Um, if you applied the Canadian guidelines to Ireland, it would not be anywhere near considered a zone 10. I don't know what it would be, but um, it would be very different because different things grow there. It's a different climate and that would be captured with the rainfall, the wind, you know, the, the annual highs, the annual lows, that would all be included in the calculation for determining what zone it was. So Canada does have a similar map to the USDA plant hardiness zone. It's a little confusing because what we've already talked about is what we call our plant hardiness zone, but we do have an extreme minimum temperature zone map, which is basically what the USDA plant hardiness zone is for the US. It's strictly just minimum temperatures and um, I never see it used. <laughs> we always use the other map, but it, it does exist. So the new USDA map encompasses the years 1991 to 2020. Um, Canada doesn't have an updated map yet. I hope we'll get one soon. That would be pretty nice. I think ours is about 13 years out of date now. Um, the current iteration includes years from 1981 to 2010. So even, even, I mean, I don't want to give my age away online, but, um, you know, my childhood years are included in those, in those early years. And we have a vastly different climate here now than, um, we did when I was a kid. So snowfall is something that comes to mind really easily. 
we used to have a lot more snow. There's a ski hill not far from us that when I was a kid, they would guarantee 100 days of skiing. They haven't done that for like at least a decade because they just don't get the amounts of snow now. Even with the technology to make snow, they can't guarantee that much anymore. So I know our climate has changed. And I think if, if, um, if our map were updated, we would also see, like they have in the US, um, about 50% of people in the updated map have kind of bumped up to the next zone. And I think the same thing will happen when we get a new map here in Canada. I don't know if it's currently being worked on. I suspect it probably is because these things mostly line up pretty well with the years and things. Um, but we will just have to wait and see. And I do kind of keep track. Um, we're able to go in and get a lot of the climate data off of the weather stations um, in Canada. And you can go in and look up all those minimums and maximums and, you know, rainfall, snowfall, all of that stuff um, for yourself. And I kind of like, I'm kind of, you know, I'm a science nerd. I have a biology degree and these are things that interest me. I work in agriculture, right? So I have a little spreadsheet that I have kept for like the last 10 years or so. And I think like, you know, they always say our frost date is expected September 19th, I think officially based on this 1981 to, to 2010 data. And I can't tell you the last time we had a frost date before that date. This year, we didn't have a hard frost until November 1st. So that tells me anecdotally at least that things have changed and I would be very curious to see updated information come out for our maps as well. Um, another thing that people always ask is, you know, do people have growing zones around the world? And how does it compare to the US? The simple answer is yes, they do. And it doesn't really compare. So a lot of places have their own, have their own systems. For varying reasons. If you look at some place like the UK, the vast majority of the UK would be considered a zone 8 or a zone 9, according to the USDA map. Um, how the UK has approached it is um, the Royal Horticultural Society several years ago developed um, basically um, like a plant indexing system. So rather than zoning the locales, they've zoned the plants, if that makes sense. So they have chosen to give values running from H1 all the way up through H6. H1 is a very tender, what would be considered a tropical plant, and an H6 would be considered something that's very cold tolerant. Um, but they haven't assigned growing zones to that. So, you know, most areas of the UK would be able to grow down to an H3 or an H2. I don't know exactly, but um, it, the plants are categorized rather than the location, if that makes sense. Other areas, um, if you look at somewhere like Australia, they... A lot of areas have had the USDA system applied to them, but they have developed their own system. Um, typically, they're using a lot lower numbers. Like I think their zone three corresponds to something like a zone eight or nine in the US. And one of the problems that they have had is vast areas without um, weather station data available or data that isn't any older than like 10 or 15 years. So they're kind of catching up because, you know, they've got a lot more vast areas than a lot of the areas we're talking about in North America. Um, so it's apples and oranges. You can't really compare. I think that's why we don't really hear much about it because it's just very different and not really comparable. Canada's kind of in a unique situation and I suppose Mexico as well where we did used to be included in the USDA system and now no longer are so um so I hope this um enlightens some of the confusing conflicting information that's out there about growing zones um a lot of times 
you know, we think uh, we think we're comparing apples to apples when we're talking about the U.S. and Canada, and really that is not the case. It's apples and oranges for sure. Um, and when I'm asked, "Does growing zone matter?" I think the answer, or the answer I always give, is it depends. It depends. Where are you? Are you in the U.S.? Are you in Canada? And what are you growing? Um, I know that being a zone five Canada, I have a lot more in common as a zone five in Nova Scotia as I do with a zone five in like Alberta than if there were two zone fours in the US trying to compare their climates. I know that all of those seven factors are considered when assigning a zone here. The same can't be said um, in the US and there are other systems, there are other growing systems that are in use in the U.S. that do include some of these things, but it's not the one that we're most familiar with. Um, so I hope that helps. I hope that helps at, like clear up some confusion, not add to it. That wasn't my intention. I just thought now was, it's always one of those things that's kind of bothered me that I don't hear Canadians talking about the Canadian system and how it's different. Um, and I thought this week with the release of the new updated map in the U.S., this would be a good time to talk about it. So I hope you enjoyed that. I hope it wasn't too technical and too boring. These are like I can get very nerdy about some things and get really excited about some stuff that other people um, have zero interest in. So I hope you come back. If you stuck with me this long, I'm sure you will. Um, and I thank you for watching. We'll see you next time.